did Hitler, Caesar, Napoleon, Kamal Ataturk and Mussolini all have in common? Well, like all strongmen from the dawn of history to the present day, they wanted to seize power not by democratic means, but by brute force. And so with the backing of their supporters and the military, they would use that power to seize power. And this is the playbook that Hitler ran with. In fact, he famously said that Kamal Ataturk was his teacher, yeah, Mussolini his first student, and I his second. Because by 1923, Hitler had already seen, in the space of a few years, Kamal Ataturk, who we've mentioned in our previous video, definitely check that out, taking power in uh, Turkey. Then, the year later, Mussolini doing his march on Rome, in which he seized power. And so Hitler saw all this and was like, why can't we lead a national revolution in which we seize power in Munich, Bavaria, and then march on Berlin? But why would Hitler want to march on Berlin? Well, as we discussed in our previous video about the Treaty of Versailles and many of our other videos uh, about this general topic and this general era, what had happened is that Germany had been defeated in World War One. The size of their military was really shrunk down. They end up losing a lot of territory. They had the Rhineland occupied and they had to pay a huge amount of reparations. And the fact that Germany was unable to pay its reparations led to the French and the Belgians invading the Ruhr Valley, uh, which is the industrial heartland of Germany, in order to force the new Weimar government to pay these reparations. So the Weimar government refused to comply with this, and in fact decided that they were going to pay the uh, the workers in the Ruhr Valley to go on strike. Yeah, so basically, you know, so under no circumstances would they cooperate with the French uh, occupiers. But the problem with this plan is that they didn't have much money to, to give them in the first place. So what do you do when you run out of money? Print money. Yes, yeah, that that because that could, has never gone wrong ever ever. So those who don't know about like hyperinflation, basically to explain it, if you have one water bottle in a desert, you will pay a lot more for that than you would if you had a thousand because you know you've got a big supply of water bottles and therefore the value of that one water bottle, you go, eh, it's fine. I'm not going to pay a lot. That's the last water bottle in an entire desert you're going to pay an arm and leg for it, right? And so this ends up being the problem with currency as well. So when you have a lot of something, it has less value. So at the start of this period, one US dollar bought 17,000 marks. By the end of this period, one dollar would buy 200 billion marks, okay? So just to give you a bit of an idea, a loaf of bread, that's 200 million marks. So people would take their life savings in like wheelbarrows full of money and take it down to the shop and be like, yeah, can I get a loaf of bread, please? And be like, uh, sorry, you got, you're a little bit short. So in all of this chaos, what ends up happening is people try to take advantage of this. And one of the key people who took advantage of this situation was a certain Adolf Hitler. So he was an Austrian immigrant who had been kicked out of uh, art school, not because, you know, his painting was actually quite good, actually. I have to say, don't, not endorsing Hitler, but he was actually quite a good artist, okay? Just saying. Um, but anyway, his style wasn't really distinct enough for, to warrant him kind of becoming a great, like, kind of, like, uh, painter and stuff. And so as a result, he was rejected from that school. Um, he then ended up being homeless for many years. And then in 1913, he immigrated to uh, Germany and began to live in Munich. And the following year, World War I began. And this is when Hitler, you know, we can see a picture of him in the crowd there. And, you know, he's cheering on uh, the start of World War I. And as soon as he can, he signs up and fights on the Western Front. For four years, you know, he ends up, you know, being very, very brave, uh, ends up getting medals and stuff for being a, a, a courier, so like, you know, a messenger boy, basically. And, you know, like, this is obviously running through the trenches and, you know, it's, it's very dangerous work and stuff. And he was injured several times, uh, most notably at the end of the war, where he ended up suffering from a gas attack. And so while he was in a military hospital, uh, you know, trying to get his, like, vision uh, back in place, this is when he heard news of Germany's surrender. And... You know, he, he rolled about in anger and, and frustration and in a feeling of betrayal, yeah, like kind of that Germany had basically won the war. Because as we discussed in our previous video, German troops were occupying like kind of like enemy territory. There, there was like almost no allies who actually uh, came into Germany itself. And so as a frontline soldier looking at it, you think, well, we're winning the war. Um, but obviously situation back home, the, the situation with the uh, actual German economy and their war effort, etc. Yeah, realistically, Germany lost that war. However, Germany losing this war in this way fed into this uh, stab in the back myth, which Hitler wholeheartedly believed. 
And so he believed that Germany's defeat in World War I was a, as a result of uh, a Judeo-Bolshevik uh, conspiracy against the German people. And yeah, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? But anyway, that's what he believed. And so upon returning to the home front, he then ended up getting involved in uh, nationalist politics in, uh, in Munich. And this is how he ended up kind of rising to prominence, yeah, in the beer halls uh, within Munich. You know, if you ever go to Munich, they've got lovely beer halls, but just understand that they do have quite a dark history about them. And so what Hitler planned to do was to storm into one of these beer halls on the 8th of November, 1923. And he already knew that there was a group of nationalist uh, leaders who, who were meeting there. And, you know, at this point, Hitler wasn't really well known. And so he'd asked to join them and they were like, yeah, no, not really. Like, and we, we might allow you to kind of like join uh, join us, like, you know, tag along with us, but you're not leading this movement, like we're in charge, okay? And so he decided that he was going to one-up them. And so he stormed into this packed beer hall uh, with his men, stood on one of the tables and fired a shot into the air and proclaimed, the national revolution has begun. We have the building surrounded. Anyone who tries to leave will be shot. And as you can imagine, the other attendees in this beer hall were not so pleased. Um, and, you know, they, they, and they, first of all, they're like, who's this guy? Second of all, they're like, no, seriously, who is this guy? Like, what are you doing? And so what Hitler then did is he took the leaders uh, into a separate room and basically held them hostage. And he was waiting for General Ludendorff to come. Now, General Ludendorff was a very prominent uh, uh, leader um, uh, during World War I. Uh, he was, you know, one of the decisive uh, generals. And so after the war, he got himself involved in a lot of the uh, right-wing uh, parties during the time. So he was trying to, like, really bring up a kind of, like, nationalist movement. And so he agreed to join in with Hitler in this coup, or as the Germans to call it, a putsch. And yeah, he was a bit late turning up, like very late. But eventually when he did turn up, what Hitler then did is he grabbed the, the hands of the other uh, nationalist leaders, held them up and said, your leaders are with us, yeah? will you join us for the national revolution? And as you'd expect, the crowd began to clap and they began to cheer. And they began to listen to Hitler and they began to be led by Hitler. And so it's been often spoken about, about how Hitler had this kind of like hypnotic uh, power over people. And, you know, it's difficult to know how true this is, because on the one hand, it kind of it adds the kind of mysticism of him. Like, you know, it's, so I don't know how much of it is either intentional or unintentional kind of like fluff, because, you know, if you met him in 1923, would you have necessarily, you know, I don't know. Then there's also the other angle, which is how does an immigrant who is formerly a homeless person end up taking over one of the most powerful countries in the world? So there's an element to which he, regardless of whether you obviously like him or not, and obviously I hope that everyone dislikes him, he still was an extraordinary man in the sense of the word of being extraordinary. He was not an ordinary person and you'd have to be an extraordinary person to achieve something like that. So the fact that like it said that he had these kind of oratory skills and was able to turn the crowd, I don't know how much of it was because of him or how much of it was like people being like, yeah, you know what, we kind of broadly agree with this dude anyway and we don't like the way he's kind of done it, but whatever, like he's kind of got this ball rolling now, so let's just go with it. So while Hitler had been able to turn the crowd, he hadn't turned these leaders because obviously they were rather miffed about having to, you know, be subordinate to this complete nobody. So what they end up doing is they went to Ludendorff and said, Ludendorff, can we, you know, can we... Can we call our wives and you know just let them know like we'll we'll, you know, we'll be a bit late for tea and and, just, and he was like yeah yeah sure 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 yeah yeah that, that, yeah and what they did is they went straight to the telephone station they didn't call their wives they called the army and so what ended up happening is the next day the 9th of November 1923 which ended up being known as the I'm gonna butcher the German the ninth elfte yeah like kind of yeah so 9/11 basically so when are we gonna hear 9/11 again. Anyway, yeah, so it, it's kind of an ominous day, but obviously it was a different date, but that's just how people do the calendar. It's long to explain. But anyway, and so what ended up happening on the 9th of the 11th is that Hitler and his followers marched down the street. And as they marched down the street, when they reached the Odeon Platz uh, in, in Munich, they were met by 130 uh, Bavarian state troops. And it was at this point they decided to lock arms and to march up into the troops. Because this is something similar to what uh, Napoleon had done. So he kind of said, would you shoot your emperor? So at this point, the French troops all cheered and end up being led by Napoleon again. However, at this point, 
Hitler was no Napoleon. And what ended up happening is that him and his supporters ended up being shot at. And so this little exchange here ended up in the deaths of four um, state police um, and 16 Nazis. And Hitler himself was injured because uh, the person uh, on the flank of him uh, was shot in the chest. And so obviously as uh, Hitler is uh, locked armed with him, he ended up dislocating his shoulder as the, as the, uh, as the fallen man like, fell basically. And uh, Hermann Goering, who was also there, uh, he, he was shot in the leg and this kind of led to his uh, opiate addiction because he had taken a lot of uh, painkillers to deal with it. And so in normal cases, this would be where the story ends. You know, Hitler runs off, he's captured a few days later and he's put on trial. And in normal cases, this would be the end of the story. However, because we know what happened later, this is just the first step in the long road to Hitler's rise to power. So when Hitler ended up being put on trial, he was given a very, very lenient uh, judge and this judge allowed him to basically politically grandstand. And it was there that Hitler was able to make his case to the German people. He said something along the lines of, you may find me guilty here, but providence with a smile will absolve me from, from the, the pages of history. You know, he was able to like, make all these great speeches. This led to a great rise of prominence for him because rather than just being this kind of disreputed, failed revolutionary, he was able to create his own narrative. Yeah, he was able to build up this persona of himself as this person who you know, only cared for the for the good of the German people and have been thwarted, yeah, at the hands of Jews and Bolsheviks and, and weak people, basically. And so when the judge eventually passed sentence on him, he ended up having to serve nine months in Landsberg prison, which was very, very cosy for him. He had regular visitors, you know, he had whatever he wanted. And it was in Landsberg that he was able to have the time to sit and write Mein Kampf, My Struggle, it's a mixture between uh, autobiography and also a uh, kind of political to do this. So what I've said in previous videos, I'll say again, if you're trying to understand the Nazis or you're trying to understand World War II, if you've not taken the time to read Mein Kampf, you will never understand it fully, okay? So any serious historian studying this era needs to read Mein Kampf because then you will understand what Hitler had in his mind and then you will understand everything else will fall into place because it was a clear plan of everything that had happened and everything that he planned to take place. If you don't understand it, if you've not taken the time to read it, you will never have a clear picture of what Adolf Hitler was or what the Nazi party was and you will, yeah, the rest of the period you just won't make any sense to you. So within that book, he talks about his life experiences. He talks about, you know, his, his like how at every point, like kind of he'd been undermined and, and like, you know, stopped from being able to succeed, et cetera, et cetera. And how he'd like struggled throughout his life and talk about his war experience. And but then also laying out what he like thought of the world, what he thought about Germany, what he thought about what Germany should end up being like. And he laid out very clearly who the enemies of Germany were. And this was the Jews, this was the communists, this was the socialists, and this was also the like liberal uh, capitalist. Yeah, he devotes an entire chapter to liberalism, communism. He kind of just he just kind of goes, oh well, it's like a Jewish conspiracy, right? Um, because it's like internationalist. Yeah, but he doesn't really talk that much about socialism or about communism. He devotes an entire chapter to criticizing a liberal democracy and parliamentary like democracy because that's where he sees that the, uh, the real threat being and this is the real reason why he's trying to overthrow the Weimar Republic because he sees the Weimar Republic as being a fundamental threat to Germany and to its like and to its future prosperity you know he sees that as being the weakening of Germany of allowing kind of like Jewish like socialism and communism etc cetera, etc cetera, to basically corrupt um, Germany and to basically rot it from the inside and he sees that as being weak and indecisive at a time when Germany needs strong leadership and needs a strong sense of national direction. 